Okay, so we can uh, continue. Um, we'll try to um, to wrap up uh, this uh, this session with the signal propagation. So I was on the um, I was on climate, and we described this kind of symphony uh, with a melody on the long long uh, time scales here. Uh, maybe driven by um, plate configuration, Wilson cycles, great uh, uh, solid earth uh, uh, changes. We described the high frequency beat of climate, which has quite dramatic effect. Huh? We spoke about the penguins in Marseille. Uh, these may have quite uh, dramatic uh, effects on landscapes. And now I wanted to speak more about what you see here in the middle. In the middle, uh, what I plotted here, what is plotted here is a curve, um, which is here in black. That's the main one of this diagram over the late Cretaceous and Cenozoic of the oxygen isotopes in, I think it's in benthic uh, forums. And so the, this curve was, uh, was progressively put together by syn synthesizing many, many uh, data. Um, and there's one paper in particular by uh, James Zakos uh, in 2001. And the title of this paper is uh, um, Trends, Rhythms, and Aberrations. So that Cenozoic Climate, sorry, I forgot the exact title, but, but it's about Cenozoic Climate and it's called Trends, Rhythms, and Aberration. And what he refers to, so of course, in this delta weighting curve, what you read is it's a proxy for temperature. A proxy is an indirect measurement. So by looking at delta O18 in four arms, um, because we know that the amount of the, the proportion of the different isotopes is linked with temperature, we have a proxy of temperature. We cannot measure the temperature 40 million years ago because it's finished, it's past. But we can have a, a record of it, a record of this past temperature. Okay, so it's a proxy for temperature. Um, and so Zakos put this curve together, and of course, the trend he speaks about is this warming here and then cooling trend. It's kind of the Melody we've spoken about at a long time scale, but it's here on the Cenozoic. The rhythms he speaks about uh, refers to this beat of that is the, the of which is set by astronomical uh, cycles, very regular. And then he speaks about aberrations, so anomalies. And the anomalies he speaks about are the little things that have, I have highlighted here. Uh, Paleocene, Eocene thermal maximum. You will need to zoom uh, on the PDF, but here, somewhere at the Paleocene, Eocene boundary, 56 million years ago, you have a sudden release of, I mean, that's what is currently um, said is that you have a sudden release of more than 3,000 gigatons of carbon. And perhaps uh, the climate was also more sensitive. So the effect of releasing carbon in the atmosphere is that uh, you have a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere and therefore a very strong greenhouse effect. So the earth warms up. The idea is that nowadays, we are also in a state of in a in a in a in a period of global warming, because by burning hydrocarbons, uh, essentially we 
increase the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. It's a greenhouse gas, and therefore the Earth warms. Um, there is a question about climate sensitivity, and it's a very, very important concept. And I, I always think about it uh, as our own human sensitivity. For instance, in the morning, uh, if you live with uh, someone else and you wake up in the morning and you, you walk barefoot in, your, in the kitchen to breakfast uh, and you walk on crumbles because the person before you has already had breakfast and left a lot of crumbles on the ground and you walk barefoot, then you walk on crumbles. And whether this uh, really makes you crazy or not, depend on your mood, on your sensitivity. It can be either your general sensitivity to these type of things, or it can be your that morning sensitivity. Sometimes we say in French, se lever du pied gauche is when you wake up on the, you get up on the wrong foot, and then you're very sensitive and everything um, which happens makes you really grumpy, for instance. That's your, that's a high sensitivity, let's say. Um, okay, so the sensitivity of the earth is, in a way, is its a reaction in terms of temperature um, to changes in the parameters that, that, that define this temperature, that, that determine the, the temperature. So, for instance, if you increase, if you, if you release 3000 gigatons of carbon in the atmosphere, it may not have the same effect always. For instance, if you are here, maybe releasing 3000 gigatons of carbon is not the same as if you are here. Okay, this maybe is a post breakfast time when you're relaxed. Uh, and this is a before breakfast time when you're really hungry and you really want food and you can't be, uh, yeah, you can't stand crumbles on the ground. Okay, so, so this is the, the sensitivity uh, of the earth. And so we don't really know, uh, but there's a lot of work going on on this. How has the sensitivity of our earth varied over time? Um, because you know you have those pre predictions uh, with the current state of uh, CO2 emission uh, we project a certain global warming. What if by warming the earth, the earth becomes more sensible, more sensitive, not sensible, more sensitive to uh, the injection of CO2. So this is taken, a, taken into account in some predictions and some models, but that's a very important parameter. How will the earth react with more and more CO2 in the atmosphere? And so the PETM is an, a brief event of very strong global warming, maybe suddenly uh, five to eight degrees more in the atmosphere. And then it cooled down over 100, 200 kilo years. And incredibly, I find the trend continues. So there is an aberration, but the trend continues, which is incredibly interesting that you, you know what, I, I mean, the, the trend is set by something else. It's like you in the morning, you're determined to go walking and you're gonna go walking, you're gonna go into the office. It's not because of the crumbles that you're gonna stop your, all your plans. And it looks like the, the earth is doing the same. It has a, it's on a trend of warming here and it's going on to this trend, okay? Despite the aberration in the middle. Okay, something happened here, a catastrophe, uh, but still the trend goes on and, uh, and, and the earth is on its way to warmer and warmer temperature. And then it reaches here what is called the early Eocene climate optimum. And so this is the highest temperature the earth has known, uh, except of the PTM perhaps, uh, in the last it's at 50 million years about that we reached the top. So, and there the, 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 the earth was totally different as today in a way, uh, not so much in terms of plate configuration, but still there was quite a lot of difference, but also because the, the idea is that perhaps you had, uh, you know, crocodiles uh, at the North Pole 
and palm trees everywhere on earth uh, could uh, they could uh, they could be happy everywhere on the earth so so the earth was really warmer maybe 24 degrees of global temperature okay um, nowadays i remember i remind you we are at 14 degrees so maybe the earth was 10 degrees warmer than today and from then on it cools down as we have seen here uh, but what, what is not on this curve is that there are several other aberrations here, several other short intervals of warmth and, uh, and cooling afterwards. And there's one also here called the MECO, Middle Eocene Climate Optimum. Uh, so somewhere at 40 million years, you have a, a warming uh, event. Here you have the Eocene Oligocene glaciation. Um, it's, the, it's the beginning of the development of ice in Antarctica. And that's a very strong cooling event. And then you have the Miocene climatic optimum. It's not really an aberration. It's kind of a short term tendency. But in the mid Miocene, the temperatures uh, rose a little bit with a plateau here, and then it cooled again. So this cooling trend is really, it's a long term cooling trend, OK? And it's punctuated by super brief episodes of very strong climatic perturbation. Some less strong and more longer term, and then it, it cooled down. And then now we have this really strong trend of accelerated cooling in the Playa Pleistocene, reaching here. You also see that the variations become really strong now. And these are these cycles we see here. Okay, if you look at the scale, and you look at the scale here of uh, benthic delta weighting. And so that's this last cooling here is the, we have full glaciation in the South Pole in the Anta Antarctic. And we now have development of ice in the Arctic, in the North Pole. <coughs> so, um, this curve, I think, is a, is a revolution. It, it was limited, the knowledge of it was limited to climatologists and paleoclimatologists. It derives mainly from, from the analysis of uh, tons and tons of uh, little organisms uh, sampled on oceanic, uh, in, in deep ocean uh, cores. And so, so this didn't really propagate, uh, as I told you before, uh, in the historic uh, aspect of this source to sink lecture. This did not really propagate to, uh, I would say, us, uh, classic, classic uh, sedimentologists and stratigraphers um, until we realized that we need to understand sediment routing systems as a whole. And when we think about that then climate is not just eustasy, but it's also this uh, climatic curve, because this should have, we don't really know, uh, I showed you one example of where it does, but it should have an, a, an impact on sediment flux to the basins that we are studying. And when I did my PhD, we didn't speak about, I was studying, as I told you, I was studying in the Bartonian, and we didn't speak about the Middle Eocene Climatic Optimum. Okay. Uh, and so I was looking at my sediments without even knowing that there was such an event. And so you can imagine how much you may miss if you don't know that. You may, you may think, oh, you see a pulse of sediment in your basin, and you don't look at climate at all, okay, because these are papers published Okay, this was published in Nature, but these are papers published in, a, in the paleoceanographic uh, community. And so you see a pulse of sediment, you're in a fallen basin, you think, oh, there was a pulse of tectonics upstream of my basin. This must be the mountain range, but maybe it's global climate, actually. Um, so far, I've spoken only about temperature, but the second... Um, not the, not the second most important variable, but uh, the other most important variable uh, is water. And here there is a, an envelope 
of precipitation variations in continental Europe. It's a paper by uh, Moss Brugger and colleagues published in PNAS, uh, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science. And I can't tell you when it is, if it's 2005 or 2013, uh, or maybe another uh, year. Um, but I will provide a list of, uh, of references. And so this is based on a range of proxies, among which a lot come from vegetation. And um, Greg Retalak also did the same for North America, I think, with uh, proxies from paleozoids. And they relate to mean annual uh, precipitation, MAP. And you see that there are variations. Uh, but they are not so clear to me, at least, uh, how those relate to temperature uh, variations. Uh, still, we have periods with, with large uncertainties, and there are periods with increased precipitation. Um, and it makes a big difference, OK, if you are at 1,000 or 1,500, OK? It's really a lot. Um, if you look in valleys here in the valley, uh, you have less than 700, I think. I think it ranks like the valley of uh, Tesh, Zermatt, uh, ranks as uh, semi-arid or something like this. Whereas the whole of Switzerland is more like 1,400, I think. So it's, it's more temperate unit. And you see that when you look at the, the landscape. The other important curve here is a curve uh, by uh, Comins uh, and colleagues, among which uh, uh, Miller. It's a paper in Basin Research 2008, and it's a sea level curve um, derived from, it's, it's the curve you see also here. So it's quite different from the Exxon curve. And it's a curve which is derived from a mix of data, I believe. One is the onlap. Uh, and uh, um, backstripping uh, reconstructions made from the uh, east coast of the United States. Another element is Delta O18. And another element is a correction for dynamic topography. Okay, if I just go back to, to here, You can imagine if you measure sea level on a margin, which is going down because of dynamic topography or up because of dynamic topography. Let's say you look at the onlap, the constant onlap. Uh, you could have no variation in sea level, but if the mantle drags down your lithosphere, you're going to see an onlap. The sea will, will inundate this area. So you have to try to provide corrections for those dynamic topography uh, vertical motion if you want to create an accurate uh, sea level curve, uh, eustatic sea level curve. <coughs> but there is a good correspondence, I think, uh, can be seen between the sea level curve and the temperature. We see that it's relatively stable when I, I mean, if I if I imagine an average here, and then it's growing, and then I mean it doesn't reach a maximum where there is the maximum temperature. Actually, there is a quite a low here, um, and then it decreases and it decreases and it decreases continuously until today. Okay, so sea level here seems to be well correlated with uh, with temperature, and you can see also that sea level is. As, as its own pace of uh, variation. And this pace of variation here um, has a little bit of the asymmetry that we see uh, at a much uh, higher frequency. And it's, uh, I don't know why, and I don't know if it's true or if it's a bias of the stratigraphic record. But um, you see the length scale of this is maybe uh, these cycles are maybe two, four million years, two million, often one million. And some of them may be a convolution 
of these uh, parameters and those parameters at a longer uh, time scale. Um, okay. So I think we've seen climate uh, quite well. We have, uh, but if you want, you can re remember the Zacos uh, part of the Zacos title. Um, trends, rhythms, and aberrations. I think this gives you a good, um, a good uh, motto to remember what's up with climate in terms of signals. There's long-term trends. Uh, there is a rhythm, very regular and there are aberrations. So when you look at the sedimentary succession, depending on the, on the duration of the succession you're looking at, on the thickness and, and, and the, the, the time it represents, um, you can think about in which trend you are and what it should give to your, what it should, how it should be expressed in your sediment. Are you, you know, in the Triassic? going from outer house to greenhouse? Are you in the rising limb of the Cretaceous? It's gonna give, it's gonna, it's gonna leave an imprint into your sediment, perhaps. And then you see things at different scales, but you often see cycles, stratigraphic patterns. Are they the result of sea level changes, temperature changes, precipitation changes? Are they regular? Are they like a bit? Or are they telling more a story of a convolution of this bit? Or are they, are they link, linked to some sort of aberration? Ah, I forgot. Some aberrations I point here. OK, the, this PTM and the, there are aberrations within the early Eocene climatic optimum, the middle, the middle Eocene climatic optimum. These these aberrations here are, are called hyperthermals, hyperthermal, hyperthermals, because they are brief events, geologically speaking, of global warming. And they are very analog in a way to what happens today, except that what happens today seems to be actually much faster and much more dramatic than these events. So there are these hyperthermals. Now there is other aberrations in the Jurassic and Cretaceous, at least that I know. Uh, and they are placed approximately. Uh, Maxime Tremblay, who is working in my group, sent me these. Um, uh, the, 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 I asked him, can you, can you give me the, the, the different ocean anoxic events that take place? Uh, and, and I. He gave them to me precisely, and I placed them approximately. Um, and you know, uh, from you guys from Lausanne, uh, because you've worked with uh, Thierry Adat, uh, you know a lot about this. I don't know, Betim, if you, if you know as much, but um, there is those events that we can see, especially in, uh, I think, especially in carbonate successions. And it's true that the Jurassic and Cretaceous are, have a lot of carbonates. Um, there is uh, those ocean anoxic events. So these ocean anoxic events, the Toarchian ocean anoxic events, and then they have little names, little numbers, OAE1A, OAE1B, OAE2, OAE3. Um, they have names like the Bonarelli, I think, uh, event, uh, the Weissert of the name of Helmut Weissert, a, a professor at uh, ETH. Uh, these ocean anoxic events seem to be uh, moments where the whole ocean, the entire ocean was anoxic. And so it adds or, or add anoxia uh, in it uh, globally. Um, and I don't know them well, but it seems that um, uh, so those moments uh, are moments that there was so little um, oxygen in the ocean that the organic matter couldn't be oxidized and was therefore uh, very well preserved. Uh, and 
And so, so these ocean anoxic events are often associated uh, with deposits that are very organic rich. Uh, in terms of uh, carbon and oxygen isotope excursions, I wouldn't uh, say because I would be afraid to say something wrong. Uh, but I imagine uh, at least sometimes there must be a quite negative carbon isotope excursions. But these also seem to be aberrations. Uh, and I don't know how they are linked uh, with what happens on the continents, um, because they are mostly um, identify, identified, as far as I know, in the oceans. They are ocean anoxic events. But there must have been a strong impact in the atmosphere and in the continent as well. So, 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 so the aberrations are not only uh, in the Cenozoic, but there is also in the Mesozoic. And I guess uh, the fact that there is not many on this diagram is because I have uh, little knowledge about this, but also because our ability to reconstruct such brief events in deep time is, is uh, maybe difficult. Okay, the more, the, the deeper you go in time, uh, the least resolution you have to distinguish uh, brief events uh, of uh, global change. Although sometimes they have such a high magnitude that we can see them. Okay. Yes. Thanks. So we are uh, now going to speak about a third type of signals. Of signal is the autogenic signals. Um, and so I wanted to start. It's, it's a whole domain and it's a fascinating uh, domain. But I wanted to start with um, the part on the, on the left of this uh, slide. Uh, it's a paper that is uh, not at all coming from, from a geologist. Huh? It's people who have studied uh, a rice pile. And I will show you uh, a rice pile here on, on uh, YouTube. But here you have a close-up photography of the rice pile. So what they do is um, what they do is uh, is they they uh, deliver. They have a, a plate and they deliver rice. So you can do that at home if you want, except that it's uh, very messy when you start playing with rice. But you you can uh, so they they uh, they have rice uh, being delivered. And, and it makes a pile, okay? A bit like a sound pile when you, when you look at quarries around, when you drive and you see a quarry uh, with gravel and sand, um, you see big sand piles. And as you've remarked on those sand piles, there is a, the sand piles, they have, a, they have an angle, okay? They have, they have flanks at a certain angle. And so the question is, how do they always reach the same angle? Why is the angle such a, if you observe the angle, you will find always uh, that it's, it's very constant. It's very consistent from one sound to another or from certain condition to, to certain condition. And rice is the same. If you play with rice, you will see you always keep the same, you, you keep delivering rice and it always keeps the same, uh, the same slope. And so on this close up, we see a little bit why this happens is that so the grains are oriented uh, to the slope globally, but they have quite a range of orientations. And they kind of imbricate into each other. They kind of build on top of each other. And sometimes they build such that, uh, you know, for instance, this grain here will stop a grain and it will accumulate another grain here. And so they build up such that you have quite strong local variations in slope. Here, for instance, you have a cliff of rice. You see that? And so this cliff is yes. unstable, like any cliff. If you remember Randa, uh, 
uh, B-team, as we spoke before, uh, there's this big landslide in Randa, and it's exactly the, 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 the rice pipe. Okay, so there is, a, there is a big cliff, and this cliff is not stable. And so what happens is that at some point, there's one more grain of sand that comes up on top, and it destabilizes everything, and there's a movement of rice, a very strong movement of a lot of rice from here down. But by going down, it's going to create another cliff down. And so the, the, the landslide, the, the perturbation, the catastrophic readjustment of slope locally is going to propagate down the system. So they, they show this on this figure here, which is a profile, where you see a cliff here. And when you see different areas, which are areas where sound, where rice redistributes downstream. And overall, we keep a long slope, okay? Because constantly there is this little slip events that constantly bring the slope to an equilibrium. Okay? And yes. all the time, if you measure, let's say you have a scale here in the balance, and you measure the amount of rice coming in by weighing the amount of rice coming in. You can, you will see something like this. So there is a constant because you're delivering rice from up here in a constant manner. And so it comes in a constant manner down. But there comes also avalanches. Boom, 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 etc. Okay. Smaller, bigger. Uh, but there is a certain distribution of avalanches coming in. Okay. And so the system is said to be critical and it's self organized. So the system here has its own dynamics. And people have called it SOC, SOC, self organized criticality. And what's interesting for us is that you deliver rice at a constant rate. But the output here is rice being delivered, not at a constant rate, but with some variations. So the system here, this transfer system here, it's a transfer system. This transfer system here uh, transforms a constant input signal into a variable output signal. So it's a mess, basically, because if rivers do that, uh, you know, a climate change upstream will be completely destroyed by this. And that's a paper by Doug Geralmack and Chris Paola, uh, which I should speak about, but uh, the, this PowerPoint is not finished yet, as you know. Um, and in this paper, uh, Geralmack and Paola explain uh, how a signal can be shredded to shred is to, uh, you know, a shredding machine is this machine that destroys uh, your paper. You see that often in, in uh, American movies when uh, there is somebody, a secretary who wants to hide uh, an important paper, she destroys it uh, or he destroys it by throwing it in a, in a shredding uh, machine. Okay, so actually if this avalanches have a period of time of recurrence time and a magnitude that is comparable to climatic cycles then it's gonna the signals the, the the signal is going to be shred and hidden by the internal dynamics of the system and so i just want to click on this and to share, to share the, um, the rice pile, um, window, zoom, and I should go full screen and I should set playback speed to 0 0.25. And so here they deliver sound and sun is going out, uh, sorry, not sun, but uh, rice. And rice is going out here. And you, you know, it's constant filming. But you clearly see 
that the slope remains overall the same, but there are waves of avalanches. So it builds up and then it collapses. Builds up, collapse, and the collapse propagates downstream, uh, downstream the system. Okay. So the, the merit of, of uh, looking at this is to realize that um, if, if we translate it for, for our purpose, is to realize that uh, uh, geomorphic systems, uh, which we, called, we could call also sediment transport system or sedimentary systems, have their own internal life. Okay, they have their own internal dynamics, their own internal behavior. And uh, whether it's a, an alluvial fan, a braided river, a meandering river, uh, waves crushing on the, on the shoreline, uh, shelf currents, or uh, turbidity channels, turbidity globes, all of these depositional environments they do have uh, some internal life dynamics. And it's important to, for us to understand the, the lives, the internal dynamics of those systems, to be able to evaluate when we look at the sedimentary record preserved in, the, in rocks. It's, it's important to evaluate whether, whether what we are looking at is the expression of the internal dynamics of the system, hmm. or whether it's the um, it's an external signal, it's a forcing, it's the signature of climate, uh, sea level, and it's something that has to do with the history of the of the planet. Um, get out of here. We'll go. Yeah. Um, okay. I. I'll try to continue because time is running, but um, here I want to show an example of this autogenic signal in a sedimentary. Uh, um, in a sedimentary context. And that's a, a, a little uh, experiment that we have done. Um, and let me show this to you here. Uh, I do not want, you can hear the sound. Maybe I want this to be bigger, but the resolution is maybe bad. But here, this was in 2016. I was at uh, in Minnesota in the in the laboratory of Chris Paola, and we did little experiments uh, of uh, our our idea was to simulate inside valleys. You know, you have uh, this. This is um, foam. Uh, you know, the foam isolation foam that we cut, and we cut a valley into it, and it's actually glued with uh, tape, so it's very uh, handcraft. It's very small. Huh? And here upstream, we have a sediment feeder. There is an alluvial fan, and this alluvial fan feeds a transfer system, which delivers to the sea. We are in a big basin, which is called the delta basin, and we can control sea level. And so sea level is going to rise. And this was preliminary experiments to some bigger experiments that we've now uh, published with Laure Gary. Uh, and these, these small experiments were actually a failure because we didn't calculate that this would float at some point with, uh, with rising sea level. So the experiment actually, uh, so our incised valley started, started to float. Uh, but anyway, at the beginning, they are nice because we deliver uh, sound and there is a bit of uh, coal in it to make a color and to also simulate the fine-grained sediment. So here, we basically, our incised valley is exposed. If it's, let's, let's imagine we are looking at a real landscape and not at a baby river in a, in a, in a, in a lab. Uh, we have an incised valley. We, have a, we can walk here and see this valley. And it delivers sediment to a low sea level. 
the sea level is low it's, and it's at the edge of the incise valley. So we have a low stand delta in, the, in terms of uh, sequence stratigraphy. And what I just liked uh, in this, so, so sea level is rising. You don't really see it, but sea level is rising. And you see that the river starts to also aggrade. The, the valley starts to be filled with sediment. But the delta here, uh, you can see its own dynamics. Uh, the, the main channel is de delivering here now, but it's moving. It, the, the river is splitting. You see there is more sediment coming here now more sediment coming here, and you create new sediment at different places, OK? Now there's been a bifurcation upstream, and it, and it, uh, now the, we don't have just one big mouth bar, but two mouth bars, OK? So this is incredibly accelerated. Uh, if it was, uh, if it was um, I cannot, uh, we don't see it accelerating. We just shift. Um, but it's. Look at this, for instance, happening now. You have a bifurcation, and then it comes back to the same channel. So this is what is called autogenic dynamics of the delta. Because here, the delta does not, there, there is a slope aspect to it, like the rice pile slope. But there is also the, the shoreline. You see this delta X shoreline? The, yes. What is critically organized here is to have a is to have a shoreline that is deltaic that is that has this this shape here. It's not like the the river progresses and we have a long long bound, a long progradation. Uh, you know the 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 self organized criticality here is to is to distribute very equally sediment everywhere in the system such that you have kind of a radial form, which has the same uh, distance from the apex everywhere. It's almost half a circle, OK? And so if the delta grows too much here, then the river will switch and fill here, and then switch and then fill here. And like this, there is some sort of compensation of the topography, OK? Yes. So, thank you. So I switch off this and I come back to this. Um, this was studied a lot by people working also initially with, uh, with Chris Paola or in co co collaboration at least. But uh, for instance, Kyle uh, Straub and Elizabeth uh, Hajek and uh, Yin and Wang um, have studied this a lot. Uh, and in this paper, which is called scale dependent compensational stacking, uh, they estimate the autogenic time scale of this uh, process. So you see they, they also did deltas in a much nicer way than we did. Uh, their system is, is also somewhere in the delta basin or in a type of delta basin. And their question was to try to understand what is the time scale for this process that we've just seen happening in the delta. Because it's the same question as for the rice pile, is that if it's a time scale that is comparable to climatic cycles or tectonic changes, then it will mess up our ability to comprehend the stratigraphic record in terms of uh, the history of environmental changes. OK? And they come with this super elegant <laughs> Uh, super elegant equation here that the, the characteristic time scale for compensational stacking is equal to L divided by average R. L is a character, character, characteristic scale in the system, and R is a characteristic rate in the system. And in this case, L is channel depth the depth of the channel that we were just observing, not the depth of the valley, but the depth of the little channel here that we're distributing sediment in the delta. And R is the uh, sedimentation rate or subsidence rate. Both are equal when the system is at equilibrium. OK, so you divide, you divide a length by a length itself divided by time. So you obtain a time. In terms of dimensions, we're okay. Um, 
Now, what I find super interesting is to apply this to, to natural systems, and that's what they did. Uh, they do that for uh, the Mississippi, uh, lower Mississippi River. And Excuse me? Sorry? Bernard is out. Oops. Thank you. Uh, she's back in. Sorry, I cannot catch uh, participants. Leonardo was out as well. I admit. So we're going to make a break, but I just finish on this. Yeah. Um, so using a channel depth for the lower Mississippi of 30 meters and a subsidence rate of 0.26 meter per kilo year, they estimate uh, for the past, which is estimated for the past 8 million years, the subsidence rate, they estimate a TC of 115 kilo years. So the time scale for the compensations, for, so it's in a way it's the time scale that you need to fill in, uh, to make a strata basically, okay, at the scale of the entire delta. Uh, and so they find 115 kilo years, which is interestingly and surprisingly similar to eccentricity cycle here, 100 kilo years. Okay, so it seems that in the Mississippi system, at least, we might be in trouble to distinguish between uh, stratigraphic cycles created by eccentricity with a frequency of 100,000 years and stratigraphic cycles potentially created if this analysis is correct by simply the, the internal life of the system. 